but true success comes from a times a power of association. Who do you have on your team? Do you have people on your team who are strong where you are weak? Do you have the mentors that can open doors? That power of association is so important. Times A, which is take action. So many times we know what we're supposed to do. We just don't do it. You've probably heard the phrase, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. That's because they learn about it at home. And so they get to know how to do it and they keep doing it, whether it's good or bad. Hello and welcome to The Real Success Show. I'm your host, Candace Mama. If you are returning, welcome back. And if this is your very first episode, welcome. We are so happy to have you here. Be sure that you are liking, sharing, and subscribing. Today's guest is so incredibly knowledgeable. She contributed to writing Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and now she's got her new book, Exit rich. Our guest is none other than Sharon Lecter. She has contributed to so many incredible organizations through her career, including the Napoleon Hill Foundation. Without further ado, here's Sharon Lecter. I'm lovely. And how are you doing, Sharon? Doing great. Doing You're great. Absolutely beautiful. Oh, well, as do you, my <laughs> dear. Thank you so very much. I first want to thank you for taking the time to speak to us on The Real Success Show. It is such an honor. Well, it's my pleasure and it's my honor as well. It's been an inc I teach the power of association and you guys are one of my most treasured and valued associations. So oh, that means just so much to hear from you and you are someone that whenever you grace our stages Sharon you give so much value you give so much just you know confidence and I've seen it you know being the co-host on the show seeing people's comments come in and just seeing them get those light bulb moments seeing them want to take control of their financial life and I mean you're just so treasured and you know this so I just wanted to start us off there Thank you so much. That means a tremendous amount to me. I appreciate you very much. Oh, such a pleasure. But I want to start right at the beginning, Sharon. You know, you, I mean, you've done so much. It's actually mind blowing. And the biggest thing that you've done for people is really bring them to terms with money, right? Because for some reason, people, we just have such a, either a great association with money or a terrible relationship with money. And I want to know, have you always been this way? Have you always been so financially savvy? Well, Candace, I grew up in a very entrepreneurial home. At the time, I didn't appreciate it very much. I lived in a little tiny house between my mom's beauty shop and my dad's used car lot. And I had to help my dad go scrub out bathrooms between tenants at the age of 10. And so it was just my way of life, buying, building, creating, income producing assets. And I swore I never, ever wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to become a very a sophisticated professional. So I was the first generation to go to college, got my degree in accounting, and um, was one of the very first women in public accounting in the Southeast United States. And it was eye-opening for me because I saw how a lot of businesses were very successful and probably more importantly, how many of them were not. But it was um, that experience of not being in control of my own time, having a boss, that I realized at the age of 25, my parents looked a whole lot smarter. And I realized the value of what I'd learned growing up. Most were not taught that in school. I mean, we're taught to chase time for money, right? Exchange time for money, be an employee. And um, the true wealth comes from buying, building, creating assets that work for you. And so that was something that has been, was ingrained in my blood from early, early age. And then as I grew older and a little wiser, I realized that not everybody, most people didn't have that. We grow up and we, we very young, we hear things like money doesn't grow on trees, pinch your penny, save for a rainy day. So we grow up with this money negative, money negative, and this programming to be employees. And um, we, that, that's what develops this mindset of scarcity. And in order to get rid of it, you have to wake up to the fact that that's what's happened. And once you can really look at it and say, I, I believe we live in a world of abundance and you can change your attitude towards money. Because it, it, like you said, at the end of the day, you're either in control of your money or it's in control of you. And far too many people have their money in control of them. 
Mm. That is so true, Sharon. And you said at the age of 25 is where that shift came in for you. Mm -hmm. How did that manifest in your life and in your world? Well, I was um, very successful in my career as a, as a CPA. And one of my clients invited me to go with him. Um, he was acquiring a, um, a company out of bankruptcy for a new technology. And I still remember going back to my condo pros and cons on a yellow legal pad, because this was before PCs and cell phones. And it didn't help me a bit because I could argue both sides because I was very successful in my career. I had this opportunity to own a piece of the company and my hand kind of took off across the top of the page and on its own wrote, why not? And that's really still my guiding philosophy today. Why not do something different? Why not solve a problem or serve a need? Why not go the road less traveled? That's the, you know, why not explore the possibilities? And um, so I made the decision to leave. It happened to be a really bad decision. Still to this day, probably my worst business decision. But had I not made the decision to do that, I wouldn't have met a young lawyer named Mike Lecter. And September will be 41 years of marriage. So as Napoleon Hill says, out of the um, seed of adversity, out of, the, you know, out of a failure in adversity comes a seed of an equal or greater benefit. I got instant feedback. Worst business decision, best life decision. But... Um, you know, it's, that's really what started me on my entrepreneurial journey. After that, we got married, I started a woman's magazine, sold it. And then um, I met the inventor of the first talking children's book, happened to have one right here. And this was the first electronics kids had. And so we said, how can we get parents to trust us? And so we aligned with little companies like Disney, Warner Brothers, Sesame Street, Marvel Comics. And so we were able to learn so much about business and manufacturing and the power of association and um, sold that company. And that was in 1991, um, relocated to Arizona. Our oldest son went off to college and got into credit card debt. And that was December of 92. And that's when I dedicated the rest of my career to financial education, entrepreneurship education, making sure people understood how to take control of their finances and build the, buy, build and create those assets to create financial independence. Wow. And, you know, you said that it was your worst um, business decision, but your best life decision. And I absolutely love that. When you were building a business, you know, I think a lot of people right now, especially in the current world we're living in, a lot of people are looking for different avenues, right? Many people have lost their jobs, but where does one begin with that, Sharon? Like, where do you get, where did you get your confidence to really start pursuing this path of entrepreneurship, which let's be honest, is not an easy path. No, entrepreneurship can be very lonely if you try to do it by yourself. Um, in my book, the first book that I did with the Napoleon Hill Foundation, Three Feet from Gold, I share a personal success equation. And you go to personalsuccessequation.com to get the guide. And it's really combining your passion and your talent. And so for my passion, actually, was anger because we weren't teaching kids about money in school. And my talent was years as a, a public CPA, certified public accountant, and years of publishing. And so I combined those two. And most of us stop there thinking we have to do it on our own. But true success comes from a times A power of association. Who do you have on your team? Do you have people on your team who are strong where you are weak? Do you have the mentors that can open doors? That power of association is so important. Times A, which is take action. So many times we know what we're supposed to do. We just don't do it. And so taking action, being proactive, not reactive. And then plus F, faith. And that's that confidence you're talking about. Having faith in yourself, having faith in what you're doing, having faith that's needed and necessary, having faith that will succeed. And many, when I start working with somebody, it's usually the power of association and faith that needs the most work. They're not confident enough. They don't think they're good enough. They don't have the right people around them. Mm -hmm. And when you have the right people around you, the right mentor, your confidence goes up because when you have a bad day, they won't let you stay there. And so passion plus talent times association times action plus faith and confidence. Oh, that is such an incredible equation. And I'm going to list it in the show notes. And for people who are looking at you and thinking, OK, Sharon, like you came from this incredible background of, you know, accounting and you may have encountered people who were going to mentor you. But I come from this shanty little town, you know, and I don't know anyone that's really successful. Where do people begin building those incredible associations that you created for yourself? 
Well, it's never been easier in the world we live in because now you can access people online. You can go to um, free webinars. You can go to um, your meetups locally to start meeting people and that are in a field that you want, somebody that shares your passion. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we, you know, we recommend is if you have a passion about something, volunteer, find an organization that you can volunteer for them because in doing that, you're going to meet some of their donors, which are the wealthier people and so you're going to get established and start building your associations with people who have similar desires similar passions as yours mm. so being willing to start at a place that you not necessarily think is going to lead you to the end goal is the key to that right success, right be a giver you know because when you start giving it comes back Ooh. give of your time start meeting other people oh i love that and so you get to a point where you do associate with Disney and you write your first book. And then you have this remarkable story that you do share about, you know, how you ended up meeting a fella called Robert Kiyosaki, who many people will know is one of the authors of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and you are the co-author. So how did that come to be? Yes, it's actually a pretty funny story. So as I shared with you, a 1992 year oldest son went off to college and got into credit card debt. And that's when I dedicated the rest of my career to financial education. That was December of um, 92. And fast forward a few years, I've been working with school systems. And I got a call from my husband one day and he said, Sharon, I met a man that has what you've been looking for. So I always tell ladies when I'm speaking, I go, what would you do if your husband called you and said, I met a man today that has what you've been looking for. I still remember where I was going, okay, honey, this sounds kinky. What are you talking about? And um, this guy had not come in. My husband's an intellectual property attorney. His office is with the tall tower, downtown Phoenix, mahogany, the whole thing, three-piece suit. This guy came in and flip-flops, board shorts, and a Hawaiian shirt with this idea for a board game rolled up on a piece of paper under his arm. And so I met Robert Kiyosaki at the first beta test for the cash flow board game. And I'm the only one that got out of the rat race. Um, he spread it out the playing pieces were different caliber bullets, which of course was quite the first impression. But I believed in what the concept was because it was in alignment what I was teaching, which is buy, build, or create income producing assets. And so I volunteered to help him because of my experience with the talking book. We also did games. And I said, you know, to help him get it commercialized. And during that process, he told me he wanted to charge $200 for the game. And I said, well, that's kind of pricey. We're talking 1996. Maybe you should write a brochure about the philosophy so that people can understand it. And then they'll be willing to spend the $200. And that's when he asked me to be his partner to help him write that brochure. And so we together, that brochure actually became a little book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And most people don't know that this was actually designed and written as a marketing tool. And it took on a life of its own. The world said, no, your brand is not cash flow. Your brand's rich dad. And so all of a sudden we said, well, maybe we'll write another couple of books. So we do a trilogy, rich dad, poor dad, cash flow, quadrant, rich dad guide to investing. And the world wanted more. So in the 10 years we worked together, we did 15 books in the rich dad series, co-authors on all of them. And um, the, the, the brand expanded around the world over 108 countries, over 51 languages. So um, it really was the right message at the right time, and it really helped people open their eyes to be taking control of their financial well-being. Mm, sure, because I know that growing up, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, and I just love the idea and the way it was presented in a way that I could understand money for the first time, really. And so that was your passion, because your son was also, you know, in credit card debt, Sharon, so... Where did that lead you to seeing the success of the Rich Dad Poor Dad franchise? Where did you decide to branch out to? Well, in 2007, we'd been partners for 10 years and he, he and I were no longer aligned on what we wanted to do with the company. He wanted to go into franchising. I did not think it, it was a great model for us financially, but I didn't think it was a good model for the franchisees. So that was a trigger that made me decide to, to leave. And as I share many times, sometimes you have to close one door for new doors of opportunity to open. I did not know what was in store for me. And we were at the height of our success, but I made that decision. And sometimes you just have to stand in your power. I made the decision that was right for me. And I, I've never looked back. 
but not knowing what was happening a few months later i was having kind of a good old-fashioned pity party i'm sure everybody watching would be um honest with themselves every once in a while we have those and the phone rang and it was president bush asking me to be on the very first president's advisory council for financial literacy i wish i served both president bush and president obama so equal opportunity here and um, it was an incredible honor, and I wouldn't have had that call had I still been at Rich Dad. And yet a few months later, in, the, in March of 08, we know what was happening to the economy. I got the call from Don Green, who's the CEO of the Napoleon Hill Foundation. And he asked me to step into, the, uh, into their world and help them reinvigorate the teachings of Napoleon Hill. And that was an unbelievable honor. I read Think and Grow Rich when I was 19. But to have built the largest personal finance brand and then to be asked to step into the world's largest personal development brand, what an incredible, just, I mean, it was just awesome. And I've had an incredible working relationship with the foundation, written four books with them, Three Feet from Gold, Outwitting the Devil, Thinking of Rich for Women and Success in Something Greater. And I treasure them as, again, a very, very treasured association of mine. Oh. I love it. And I mean, just thinking about, you know, you choosing to step out in faith, because it did require a lot of faith for you to step away from something that is working, Sharon, it's easy for us to walk away from things that are falling apart, right? Because we can be like, oh, I, there was nothing to hold on to. But then to walk out of something that is successful. And then in that pretty party mode, I want to like, you know, um, just go back to that a little bit, which is, you know, I do think many of our listeners, myself included, have been in that space of just uh, exhaling and being like, oh, what has my life become? Uh, for those people who are currently in that situation, what are some things that you did or some things that they can do that you think will make them, you know, look at tomorrow as brighter than today? Well, a lot of it is based out of fear and actually Outwitting the Devil, which was my second book for the Napoleon Hill Foundation, was actually written by Napoleon Hill, intended to be the sequel to Think and Grow Rich. He wrote it in 1938 and it was locked away for 72 years. His wife was afraid of the title and I had the incredible honor to bring it out. And I love it because it helps unlock the mystery of why we, um, we don't take action. And then he talks about the fear of criticism, which I think is pervasive in our world today. The fear, of, the fear of failure, the fear of um, poverty, the fear of death, fear of old age, all of those things. But what happens is he talks about how to get past that. And the first big one is definiteness of purpose. Okay, are you proactive or are you reactive? Do you know what you want? Or are in, the, in the book, he uses the term drifting. Drifters just kind of go through life, whatever. You know, they just, they kind of go with the crowd. They don't, they don't put a stake in the ground and say, this is what I stand for. And so definiteness of purpose, having a goal, having what you want to do in life is so important. And then mastery over self. I mean, self-discipline is, you know, people think of it as a negative, but it really does allow you to achieve what you want in life. And then learning from adversity. We all have things that stop us in our tracks. The question is, do you let them hold you back? As my friend Tim Story says, do you sit in the setback? Or do you turn the setback into a comeback? Learn from the past, learn from the adversity so that you can help others going through it as well. And then how do you manage your environment? What are you allowing in your space? What are you allowing in your head? You know, when you're fearful or sad or depressed, you want to just turn off the lights and get under the covers and just stay by yourself. And that's the worst thing you can do because that environment just continues with the depression. And so the issue is surrounding yourself with the right people, putting you in an environment where people want you to succeed. Put yourself in an environment where people are pushing you out of your comfort zone because the greatest new discoveries are outside your comfort zone. And then how are you spending your time? You know, during this pandemic all around the world, have you been sitting on your sofa watching Netflix or have you been taking this time to recalculate what you want and readjust your plans or your business to serve more people? And, you know, all of those things come together. And once you start really thinking about your definite enough purpose, your self-discipline, mastery over self, your um, learning from adversity, managing your environment, managing your time, it becomes good habits, right? You've probably heard the phrase, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. That's because they learn about it at home. 
And so they get to know how to do it and they keep doing it, whether it's good or bad. And so it's really important That's one of my biggest goals is to get financial education in the school system so we truly can level the playing field for every child so that they can, every child has equal opportunity to succeed. But until then, they're learning it at home. And so it's up to us as concerned adults to make sure young people have the tools and the education they need to succeed. But it's one step at a time. And for people that are... Um, you know, and, and, you know, the depression is up on a rise because of this pandemic. So many people um, are suffering and the fear of missing out. And it's like, okay, let's, what do we need to do? Reach out and touch somebody, give somebody a little boost of energy and, and happiness and know that, um, you know, there are other people that are worse off than you and whatever you're going through. You know, I tell people eight and a half years ago, I lost my youngest son. We're not supposed to outlive our kids. And I went into a major world of numb for several years. I said, living my life in neutral, lots of downs, not very many ups, and almost decided to retire and got a lot of pushback from family and friends. And I think I even heard my son in my ear say, get over it, mom, there's more for you to do. And so I say to everybody watching and listening, no matter what's happening to you right now, you're still here. And you're still here for a reason. Whatever you've been through, you six, you've survived. And what a gift you can be to someone else going through it to help them speed their way through whatever trauma or drama they're dealing with. And know that time is our only precious resource. We can make money, lose money, and make it back. But once time is gone, you don't get it back. And so every single day is a gift. And when it's gone, it's gone. You don't get it back. So make the most of every single day and be a giver. Help other people and you'll see your return. Oh, Sharon, you know, I, every time you share, you know, um, in the few moments you have shared about your loss, uh, I think many people would agree that, you know, parents are never supposed to bury their children. And so overcoming that kind of loss and still being such a giver, I think is such a profoundly powerful thing. And in my mind, it leads me back to that purpose, you know, you were speaking about, which is your purpose is to really educate people around their financial well-being, because it's not just about money, right? And mm -hmm. someone said this really well, and I want to know what your stance is on it. They said money is not about the money in and of itself. It's about creating units of choice. And so what does money represent to you? Well, success, let me start with what I think success is. Success is how you feel about yourself when you look in the mirror. It has nothing to do with dollars and cents in your bank account. And so money is just a measure. And yes, it's a lot easier to have it than not have it. Um, money is a tool to create quality of life. It's also a tool to improve other people's quality of life. And so from my perspective, the more I make, the more I can give. Um, I have never been one that has this goal of being a billionaire. Just not my goal. I just want to have a quality life, love my family, be with my family and help others as much as I can. And that's, you know, each of us has to determine what our life, what we want our life to look like. Um, I could, could I have made a lot more money? Yeah, but I would have probably sacrificed time with my children, my husband, and that's not something I was willing to do. Um, are we financially free? Yes, we have been for many, many years. And we enjoy every single thing about our lives and our family every single day. Um, would I, you know, I, I wouldn't change anything other than losing my son. But I think it's, you know, one of those things that each of us, we are where we are today because of the choices we made before today. And if you want something different out of life, simply start making different choices. Oof, choice. I love that. Sharon, you've co-authored and you've written so many books. And one that stood out to me was, you know, you did reference the fact that you had read uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Um, and I think, I mean, I've read it so many times. It's such a phenomenal book. And you went on to write Think and Grow Rich for women. And so I want to know, why did you feel that was so important to write a version that is particularly targeted at women? 
Well, it's a great question, Candace, because for most of my career, I resisted doing things specifically for women because I truly believe the steps of success are the same for men and women. But as I got a little older and a little wiser, I realized that even though the steps of success are the same, that men and women tend to approach them very differently. The original Thinking Grow Rich was written early 1900s. Women were not in business. So it was totally from a man's perspective. And then I got to the point as we were releasing Outwit in the Devil and Don Crane talked to me about doing Thinking Grows for Women, I realized I was really frustrated with the dialogue. Women were always complaining and criticizing about the men who stood in their way. You know, and if you're a true student of Napoleon Hills and the law of attraction, you know that when you complain and criticize, you don't attract positive results. And I just wanted to change the dialogue. You know, ladies, stop complaining and criticizing. Let's celebrate the progress we have made as women. Is there more progress to make? Absolutely. But let's celebrate how far we've come and let's celebrate the men who have helped us along the way. Because do you think you will approach more progress or you will attract more progress by celebration or by criticizing? Mm -hmm. And it's through celebration we'll be able to open more doors and continue making more progress. So that's one of the reasons I wrote Thinking Grows for Women. Plus, I wanted to look at each of the values that Napoleon Hill shared through the eyes of successful women who use those, those values in their own um, area of success. And I address each one of them as I've used them in my career. And then I have quotes. I have over 300 women that I highlight in the book, Thinking Grow Rich for Women. And I was really happy that I did that because it brought it home. But I also, in, in writing it, I felt this just tug to add one more chapter. So the chapter outlines are the same as the original book, but I added a 15th chapter called One Big Life. And it's because so many women are so stressed out about work-life balance. And I don't believe in it. I don't believe in the word balance. I think it only belongs in the dance studio or the yoga studio. Because when you're, when you're worried about balance, you're wasting precious time today about something that happened yesterday or something that may or may not happen tomorrow. And I have, have a definition I share about worry. To worry is to pray for what you do not want. Let me repeat that. To worry is to pray for what you do not want. So stop it, all right? So I happen to be a champion worrier and I still get my little worry storms and I stop myself and say, okay, Sharon, instead of focusing on what I don't want to have happen, reprogram my brain to focus on what I do want to have happen. So it's the same thing. Are you attracting negative or positive? Let's attract the positive. And it's really magic. It really is a miracle. You get your, your whole thought process focused on what you do want to have happen. And so the whole one big life concept, which is the last, last chapter, is we all have our spiritual, our financial, our family, our business, our fun, our community, all aspects that can make our lives. And so when, if yesterday you didn't spend enough time with your kids, don't spend precious time today beating yourself up. Just make a different decision today. If yesterday you didn't, um, you kind of were frivolous with your money, well, make a different decision today because we're the, 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 our happiness is not work life. Our happiness is one big life, how all of those things work together. I absolutely love that concept. I think since I started working um, or starting a career, the first thing I heard was, you need to figure out a great work-life balance. And I don't think any of us ever achieve it because it is always like this strange juggling act. And then, as you said, you beat yourself up when the one thing doesn't work. And then this thing doesn't work, then you spend your life just beating yourself up for the different things that you are not, quote unquote, balancing. And I absolutely love it. One well, good life. I'll have to introduce you to some men, young, two young men that I've mentored for years, and I'm just help. I'm working with them right now. They just launched a new company called Ula, O O L A, and it's it, the French word Ula La, and it's all about the one big life concept, and it's a is a it's an online tool, a mobile app where you go through and you measure yourself in seven areas of life: family, finance, fitness, friends, um, faith. Um, field, your work, and fun. 
and you judge yourself and then you set goals and it's a, you know, it's a gamified um, tool that helps you achieve your goals. I'm so proud of them. It's a great tool. I've been using it. I've been having great fun. So if anybody interested can just reach out to me, info at SharonLector.com. But it's, um, you know, you, we, the area I needed most work on is fun because I'm way too serious. So fun is what I'm working on. <laughs> and how do you have fun, Sharon? Well, my husband and I own a ranch right here in Arizona. It's three hours away from our home, primary home. It's called cherrycreeklodge.com. And it's um, 300 acres with 40,000 acres of grazing rights. We have black Angus cattle. People can come ride horses. They can help us um, herd the cattle, become cowboys for a day. You can go shooting. You can go fishing in our lake. You can just sit on the deck and see in the midst, in the middle of the Tonto National Forest. It also um, is totally off the grid. Our, our power is completely solar. We have our own well water, the best aquifer in the state of Arizona. And it's just a little piece of heaven. It's called cherrycreeklodge.com. And um, other than our time there, which is heaven, you realize the beauty of the world and the God's gorgeous landscape. Um, I also enjoy, we do scuba diving and I love being at the ocean at sunset, so. I love that. And scuba diving, it's, I mean, it's a fear for a lot of people. When did you start getting into that? It's probably been 20 years. Um, my husband and I went to Fiji um, to celebrate our, I think our 25th wedding of the anniversary. Um, and we, did, we were not certified. And the people we were with were, and we heard the stories of all the incredible things they saw and they, we couldn't, we couldn't um, go scuba diving without being certified. So we kind of made that a choice. And so we got certified, we got our kids certified and it was wonderful. We made, you know, and a couple of years ago, we, before COVID shut us down, Mike and I went to the Great Barrier Reef, one of my bucket list items. So it's, it's a tremendous fun. I thought I'd be claustrophobic, but I wasn't, it was just, it's wonderful. Oof. I'm not as adventurous as a scuba diver as a lot of people. You know, I can lead the cage shark diving to other people. I like I like um, scuba diving and seeing beautiful fish and um, in beautiful parts of the country. I'm not I'm not crazy when the water is rough, but I love it. It's just beautiful. Oh, that is fantastic. And so we, after you've had your fun and you know you relax and you work that into your arena. You know, you've just written another book, which is right behind you for those who are watching us. Uh, and it's called Exit Rich. What is Exit Rich all about, Sharon? Well, it's, it's just, it, it's my 26th book. And I'm very proud of it because it's about helping people understand when you start a business, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you start a business so you have to, so you will work until the day you die? Or do you start a business with the hope that you're going to build something that's financially successful to provide for you and your family and to give you your time back? Okay, everybody says the second, not the first, but most everybody builds the first because they don't build the structure in their business to make it a separate income producing asset. They continue to build a business around them. So they're really, they own a job, not a business. And so I want to give them the tools to build that structure so you can take your successful business, make it sustainable, make it scalable and saleable. Because when you start your business, you should be thinking about how you're going to exit. And it's 80 to 85% of businesses that want to sell will never sell because they have not structured themselves properly. And my co-author is one of the top female business brokers in the country and a mergers and acquisitions specialist, Michelle Siler Tucker. And so she's got loads of experience of the tactics of how to prepare yourself for sale, understanding the markets and the buyers. And I um, came in talking about the strategy, the why, why you want to do this and how you want to do that and how you can make yourself attractive from an investor and an advisor perspective from a mentoring perspective. And it's so important to structure yourself that way because you don't wanna work until the day you die and you don't wanna decide that you wanna sell and find out you haven't structured it right. So that's why we wrote Exit Rich and we're so proud of it. It hit the Wall Street Journal bestseller list, the USA Today and top categories and several categories on Amazon, number one. So it's been 
quite the success and it just came out at the end of June. So we're very happy with it. Wow. Congratulations. That is huge. I mean, and I can't believe it's been your 26th book. That is absolutely phenomenal, Sharon. Congratulations. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, so did you, it sounds like you wrote it to be a manifesto. So it's not the kind of book that someone's just going to read and put away. It sounds like you're going to have to read it and work through it. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. It's a, it's probably one of the more academic books that I've written, but it's chocked full of advice and examples and things that you can do to build that value. You know, you, you read this book, you're going to um, increase the value of your business without even realizing it, because you're going to understand, you're going to see. So a lot of people have intangible assets in their company, they don't even realize it. So I want to help you identify those intangible assets, protect them and leverage them, because we talk about the six P's as a process that Michelle uses in our business. People, do you have the right people on your team? Do you have people who are strong where you are weak? Do you have the right mentors, advisors? And then your product. Do you have the right, you know, do, do, is your one product possibly could be four or five products in different industries? Your processes, your business systems. You know, when you build a house, you have to go down and build a strong foundation. And you have to put in the electrical and plumbing or else you're not going to have much of a house. Same thing in a business. Your processes are what allow you to scale. And then your um, your proprietary, your the, those intangible assets, that goodwill, those things in the, that are in your value that are not on your books, like patents, copyrights, trademarks, your database. Sorry, then patrons. That is your database today. In today's world, Candice, a lot of people are very excited because they have a million followers on Instagram. We don't own those. And so your job is to entice them home. You want those followers because they're great lead generation, but then you want to entice them back to your database. You want to get their names into your database because those are assets for you. Those are intangible assets that you can leverage. And then profits. Everybody talks about profits and products, but if you don't have the other P's, you're not going to have a business that can scale. And so the whole book is about helping people build that, solidifying the structure of their business, identifying that value that's already there and bringing it to life and protecting it. Oh, I love that. And for those people who are sitting at home and thinking, you know, I really want to get a business started and really going. Would this book be something that they should read? Or is this for someone who's already established and now needs? No, it's, to it's absolutely essential. If you're going to start a business, this is going to show you how to start it right. If you want to invest in somebody else's business, this book is essential because it's going to tell you what questions to ask so you can make better judgment in your due diligence to see if the company is, is, is worth investing in. Oh, so everyone should be getting exit rich. And speaking of exiting rich, Sharon, I mean, is it not a mindset? Like you keep, you know, telling us that a lot of people have a terrible relationship with money. There are more songs that we can, like that we can mention, like, you know, money's too tight to mention. Um, and how do you help people break through that mindset um, and shift into a mode where they have a better relationship, not just with money, but with everything in their life in terms of business and generating money? Well, Kenneth, that's a, that's a million dollar question because mindset's everything. Your mindset controls um, the, the success level in your life. It controls the level of happiness you have. And you really need to start by looking in the mirror and saying, are you, you know, are you looking at life through, you know, rose colored glasses? Are you allowing money to control you? Or are you learning what you need to so that you can be in control of your money? Same thing. Are you, are, um, are you in control of, you are in control of what you listen to, what you read, who you hang out with and ask yourself, does some of that need to change? You know, you may be around and maybe your own family, maybe your own family sees that you're changing and they're not and, they, and they're and they're negative. And so I say, put those blinders on, put that cone of protection on, because if you're doing something to improve yourself, the people around you who are not are going to get jealous. And they're going to try and pull you back so that they stay comfortable. But once you can see it as what it is, you put that cone of protection on and realize, hey, right now they're not supporting me. I'm going to find people that will. But particularly if it's your family, because once you create success, they'll be your biggest cheerleaders. But it's important for you to maintain your own forward motion and make sure you have the right people around you. Oh, I love that, Sharon. I love it. And, you know, as we're nearing the end of our interview, you know, you are a money mastery expert. And 
so for people who are out there and saying, gosh, I just need a place to start with from starting to manage my money. What are some tips, like maybe two or three tips people can start doing today to start having a better relationship with their finances? Well, absolutely. I did create a money mastery course and you can see it on my website. It's, it's quite expensive. But when the um, pandemic started, I slashed the price down to practically nothing. And it's something that I do offer through success, real success, because I want to help people take control of their financial lives. And the first step is to examine your mindset around money. And the second step is to figure out where you are financially. The picture may not be very pretty, but you, my dad said, you, your map doesn't do you any good if you don't know where you are and where you want to go. And so you have to figure out where you are. And even if the picture is bleak, you're going to feel empowered because you've done something. A lot of people put their head in the sand and they just keep digging in the deeper hole. And so figure out where you are financially and then find that one step that you can take today that improves your position because that's going to give you that self-confidence to keep going. It may be looking at your credit cards and finding that $10 monthly charge for some service that you're not using anymore and you can cancel it and realize you just saved yourself $10 a month. Mm -hmm. It may be finding the lowest credit card that you have, lowest interest, this, the lowest balance and paying it off so that you're one less credit card because that psychologically is going to make you feel better. Then you can attack the ones who are highest interest rate. Um, and, and, you know, in that program, I talk about looking at your expenses and how much you spend in housing and entertainment and comparing it to your national average because that helps you identify right away where you may be out of whack. And so you start there, you get the greatest results. But again, it's about focusing in on having those small goals. I talk about little wins, Candace. You know, we have a big, a big goal. Let's say I want to lose 50 pounds. Well, I'm going to give up on that pretty quickly. All right. But if I say I want to lose 50 pounds, but now I'm going to lose five and I lose five. I go, okay, next five. And all of a sudden I'm getting that confidence because I'm, uh, I'm achieving those little goals. So I say establish little goals and then celebrate the little wins. So it gives you that confidence to keep going. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um, and I mean, yes, you do have this incredible course that you do really sell close to nothing. So if people have not attended any of our Real Success Summits, you have to come on so that you can get this incredible offer from Sharon. Sharon, you know, if you were to have a time capsule and I was to give it to you immediately um, and say, you can say one thing to 18 year old Sharon, what is something you'd wanna share with yourself? Well, Candace, I get asked that question a lot. And you know, I, I, my answer um, has changed over the years, but today I basically say, um, I probably would have said, why not at 18 instead of waiting for 25. But I also say, I wouldn't be who I am today had I not experienced everything that I've experienced in my life. And so I, I think I'm just going to say you can be anything you want, because that's what my parents told me. And, um, you know, obviously, I'd love not to have lost a child, but I, I love my family. I love my husband. I, you know, I love my life. I wouldn't change anything. And so I would probably say, why not go for it? You can do anything you want. Oh, that is beautiful. And what are some big goals or little goals that you still have for yourself that you want to achieve? Well, thank you, Candace. I continue. People say, you know, why are you still working? Because I, you know, I could have retired years ago. And one of my clients actually said to me, I don't have to work, but there's still work to do. And I thought, oh, gosh, I love that. I'm going to use it. Um, you know, I am fed knowing that I'm supporting other people finding that light finding that opportunity to make their lives better. So I will continue doing this as long as I possibly can. And, you know, my goals are, are, are really pretty small is to, you know, fill each day. I grew up in a household. My dad would ask me each night, Sharon, have you added value to someone's life today? And he's been gone for 15 years, but I still ask myself that every night. Have I added value to someone's life today? And, you know, I'm at the age where it's the little things, the little goals. You know, I've, we've had the pleasure to travel all over the world. I have a few places I still want to go, but the, those are, my, my goals are just to um, have a smile on my face when I go to bed, know that, that um, I've made the most of the day that I had before me. I love it. And would that be the motto you love your life by? 
to add value to someone's life each and every day. Yes. Oh, I love it. And, and why not? And why, why not <laughs> add value to someone's life every day? I think those are two great values to live by. Why not? <laughs> Have I added value? I think those are fantastic. And the last thing I'm going to ask you, Sharon, is what is something about Sharon Lecter that we cannot find on Google? Well, I was, everybody knows about Disney, right? And Disney World is in Central Florida where I went to high school. And I was the grand marshal for the grand opening of Walt Disney World in 1971, December. And that's not anywhere, people don't know that, so. Wow, <laughs> that is fantastic. I absolutely love it. Are there any pictures? No, of course, at the time, I didn't think about it. I was, you know, young, young and stupid at the time. But uh, yeah, it was, it was, it's not as glorious as it sounds, but I was one of the top, I was one of the top students in my high school. And so we had six high schools in the town. And so there were six of us, the top school student in each high school was the grand marshal for the parade that day. So it was pretty cool. We were with all the celebrities and escorting them. So it was a pretty cool experience for a 17 year old at the time. I mean, it's a pretty cool experience for anyone, really, Sharon. I mean, I'm a complete Disney fan. So, I mean, for me, that is like a dream. Um. <laughs> well, we're talking 50 years ago. It's hard to believe, but yep. I love it. Oh, Sharon, thank you so much for sharing so graciously of yourself. Once again, it has been such a privilege speaking to you. Well, it's been my honor and pleasure. And I truly meant it when I said, I, I value the association I have with you and with Brian and the whole team at Real Success Summits. It's a true honor and a privilege. Oh, thank you, Sharon. What have you added to someone's life, to someone's day? I absolutely love that motto because it is something I happen to live by too. Even if it's just like making my barista smile, I find that it makes my life so much richer. Please let me know what has stood out for you in this conversation because Sharon shared so much and she shared so graciously. So I'd love to hear what stood out for you. If you have not joined the Real Success Club, be sure to check us out in the show notes below. If you have not registered or attended any of our summits, make sure that you are checking us out and seeing when the next one will be because we cannot wait to have you. Oh, if this is where you choose to leave us, it has been an honor and a privilege spending this time with you. And I look forward to seeing you again next week. <laughs> <laughs>